Um, so from last lesson, I guess, um, I just introduced to you the idea that we have um, what we call fossil fuels and they can be classified as one of three, so coal, petroleum, slash oil. Um, also natural gas. Um, I also talked about how they're non-renewable energy sources, meaning that they are depleted more quickly than they are formed. So we're looking uh, timescales of millions of years to actually develop, you know, a, a decent amount of fossil fuels. Instead of just talking about fossil fuels, we're going to also talk about just carbon-based fuels. So given that they have formed from organic matter uh, or carbon compounds, then we can classify fossil fuels as carbon-based fuels. But we're also going to look at how not just fossil fuels but biofuels can also come under this sort of particular category. And we know that they are used as a source of heat energy. Um, so that could be used for transport purposes. It could be for electricity production. It could be for just general heating purposes. Um, and we did also mention in the last uh, lesson that they can be used as feedstock or raw materials for the chemical industry. So to just give you some examples of how fossil fuels in particular can be used as feedstock, um, I've got some images here just to show you um, where this can actually apply. So um, this is just showing you uh, a stage of metal production and we might think this is in particular looking at the production of iron and steel. And what we do is we end up using coal, um, a common name for it is actually coke. Um, we use it as a reducing agent. So what this will do is convert iron-based compounds like iron oxide and it will convert it into iron metal. Um, so we carry out these processes um, through essentially uh, mining and extracting ores from the ground, processing them, and then finding a way to reduce them to produce metals. So carbon can be used there. I think I mentioned this before, but uh, oil and crude oil can be used uh, for the production of plastics, but also things like lubricants, waxes, um, even asphalt. And in terms of natural gas, so we know that um, we do use methane um, in the process for uh, producing ammonia. So that's the harbour process. Um, so this allows us to essentially um, produce hydrogen, which then gets used in the harbour process. So there are examples of how these can be used as feedstock. And really the key thing is to be able to identify advantages and disadvantages. So in this case, we're looking at just for fossil fuels, what are their advantages versus disadvantages. So to just quickly go through this, we can see that advantages is that they're relatively abundant. They are easily extracted and distributed because they've been um, doing this for um, essentially almost, well, we'll say over hundreds of years. Um, there is known infrastructure for producing energy from these sources and for their use as feedstock. And we say that they have a high energy density. So per gram or per quantity, they produce a high amount of energy. Some disadvantages, so things like the fact that they're non-renewable and our reserves are depleting faster than they're being made. We know that combustion can release some undesirable products like carbon dioxide, soot and carbon monoxide. Um, they contribute to uh, the production of nitrogen and sulfur oxides. Um, so that can lead to things like photochemical smog, um, acid rain as well. So um, important to note that you know things like coal being a fossil fuel typically consists of um, sulfur impurities and that can lead to acid rain if we don't find a way to contain or convert the products as we burn them. So then this leads into the next um, set of understandings Biofuels are produced by present-day biological processes. You firstly need to identify bioethanol and biodiesel as biofuels. Uh, describe the production from biological materials of ethanol and biodiesel, including the writing of chemical equations for the reactions involved. And explain how chem um, sorry, explain how fossil fuels contribute more than biofuels to global warming. So this will link into our very first topic of the year. So just in general. Um, biofuels themselves, we can say, are derived from biomass. So that can include things like plant material as well as animal waste. So this 
can consist of bioethanol biodiesels. So this is what we're going to talk about primarily. And their major application would be in transportation. So we do know that we end up using ethanol in um, blends of fuel. So you've probably heard of E10 um, petrol. So that would contain up to 10% ethanol. Um, other places in the world can use much higher blends. So we're looking up to 85% ethanol but the cars and their engines would need to be designed to combust the ethanol instead. Um, also in terms of biodiesel, that typically gets blended with just normal diesel. Um, so it's kind of an additive um, to just ease the uh, strain on you know, um, diesel sources. So if we talk about bioethanol, um, something that we were introduced to last year was looking at how um, Ethanol can be produced through a natural process, that being from fermentation. And we're looking at the fermentation of monosaccharides. This is essentially the equation that you need to know. Um, so if we were to start off with a monosaccharide, and typically it's going to be glucose, then uh, with the action of enzymes, that's going to then convert glucose into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Where do we get those enzymes? It's essentially from yeast uh, that we use, and the yeast essentially produce enzymes that are able to convert glucose under anaerobic conditions and produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. So we know that the monosaccharides, glucose, for example, can be obtained from plants directly. But typically, plants are going to consist of other sources of carbohydrates, so that being things like disaccharides and polysaccharides. So what we may need to do is hydrolyze these before we can actually look at carrying out fermentation. And once we have produced our ethanol, usually it's not of a very high concentration, but if we want to increase its purity, increase its concentration, then we can carry out fractional distillation, separating the ethanol from a mixture of components from um, fermentation. Essentially, I've talked about hydrolysis of um, more complex carbohydrates, and we already have been introduced to hydrolysis from topic three. So we know hydrolysis is a reaction with water, where water essentially cleaves chemical bonds that would help join polymer units together. And in this case, um, we're trying to separate sugar units from one another to produce glucose. Um, we know that this is going to be aided by enzymes. And so I'm just going to go through the general equations um, of converting polysaccharides and disaccharides into glucose. So if we start off with the polysaccharide, we can see that we've got the general uh, formula for a polysaccharide like starch or cellulose. Um, so there's two examples. They typically consist of this um, general formula, C6H10O5, and we would have N lots of that. Because we have N lots of our, effectively our repeating units, what that means is that we can react it with N number of moles of water. So one water molecule for essentially every bond that forms and joins the sugar units together. And when it cleaves those bonds, holding those sugar units together, we're going to end up producing N lots of glucose. You won't need to worry too much about the physical states for this, but I've just included it there. And also with the disaccharides, so knowing that we have two sugar units joined together, for example, uh, sucrose, which is a combination of, I believe, glucose and fructose. So it would have a formula of C12H22O11, and we might note that this formula is lacking two hydrogens and one oxygen, which is what we would find two lots of glucose would actually consist of um, in total. So we would have 12 carbons, 24 hydrogens, and 12 oxygens in two lots of glucose. So that means that we can add a water molecule through a hydrolysis reaction, and then yield two moles or molecules of glucose. Uh, so what we can see here is uh, two diagrams showing you the hydrolysis processes and really it's just a summary of how we have uh, polysaccharides that can be broken down into glucose. 
So on the left, we've got cellulose aided with um, enzymes. So typically enzymes end in A's. So we could use an enzyme known as cellulase. Um, and starch, we know that the enzyme is called amylase. So that breaks down starch components into individual glucose uh, units or monomers. So now we go on to biodiesel. And I guess we don't really need to know all the steps to do with its production, but it's worthwhile just knowing how biodiesel is actually produced. And we need to know this so that we can understand how um, producing biodiesel differs from trying to use fossil fuels, um, which include normal diesel, um, and look at some of the benefits and potentially some of the disadvantages. So if we follow this kind of cycle or this sort of flow chart, we know that biodiesel essentially is produced from uh, natural triglycerides, and typically they're derived from plant or vegetable oils. So what we'd have to do is look at growing crops, essentially, and we know that the crops are going to grow through um, photosynthesis, so they will help absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. We take their seeds and we essentially extract the oils from those seeds. We refine that oil and then we use that refined oil in combination with alcohol in a process called transesterification. What that will yield is our biodiesel, but it will also yield glycerol, which does typically get used in the food industry and cosmetic industry. So the biodiesel itself then can be used in motor vehicles to produce energy, but in doing so it's going to produce um, carbon dioxide. But it kind of follows a bit of a cycle, and we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages in a moment. So something perhaps worthwhile to note down is to look at this chemical process, because it does say you need to be able to you know, describe and write equations for the production of ethanol and biodiesel. So we're looking at the transesterification of triglycerides, and typically we're looking at oils. And we can see here the structure of a triglyceride. We know it consists of three ester functional groups, but you can see it's kind of been divided up into two main sections. So this red to pink section is showing you the section derived from glycerol or propane 1, 2, 3 triol. And then these blue sections are your so-called fatty acid sections. We take our triglyceride, we react it with methanol in the presence of a catalyst, and that's typically um, some type of hydroxide like sodium hydroxide. And I guess one thing that you can think of when it comes to this process is that you essentially get a swapping of this glycerol component with this methyl component from the methanol itself. So this CH3 group essentially will take the place of that CH2 there, um, another CH3 will take the place of this CH, another CH3 will take the place of this CH2. This hydroxyl group essentially will then associate with each of these carbons in the glycerol unit, and that's what will then end up forming glycerol. And then we're left with three um, fatty esters essentially, so they would be referred to as methyl esters because they consist of this methyl group at this end of the molecule. It's not necessarily how the reaction works, but if you look at it from that perspective, it seems like this group swaps with the methyl group from methanol. Okay, and that's probably the easiest way to kind of be able to refer back to how this transesterification works. So it doesn't actually get rid of the ester functional group. It essentially converts the ester functional group from being a triglyceride to then being singular methyl esters. We can see here, I guess, a bit of a flow chart showing you how transesterification works. We're not going to worry too much about the details, but we can see that we have the combination of an oil, our alcohol and catalyst. Um, that's going to undergo transesterification to produce our methyl esters. And then we essentially look at processing that, refining that to end up with biodiesel. But we do have glycerol essentially as a byproduct that can be used for other purposes. Now in terms of, I guess, the benefits, the advantages and disadvantages, one of the key things is that biofuels will contribute less to global warming than fossil fuels. And 
to better understand this, we know that the crops that we grow for biofuel production are going to carry out photosynthesis and they're going to essentially absorb CO2. So we get carbon being essentially stored within plant tissue, but once we convert it into biodiesel and we combust that, it's going to then be released. So you can think they some de to some degree offset one another, um, and that's offsetting the CO2, obviously, that we produce through the combustion of them. The thing we have to think about is when we produce biofuels, can be a fairly energy demanding process. So what that means is that we may still depend on fossil fuels for the production of biofuels. So if we look at the production, transportation and distribution of them, it typically relies on the use of fossil fuels as well. We're gonna now look at this um, understanding. Renewable energy is generated over time scales of years to decades from sources that are replenished much more quickly than fossil fuels. Identify bioethanol, biodiesel, sunlight and wind as renewable energy sources. Compare the contributions of fossil fuels to global warming with those from renewable energy sources. So this will link into some of that information from just before. Um, this table, probably worthwhile to note down at some point, but I've just summarised the advantages and disadvantages of biofuels. So a few of the key things, we know that biofuels are renewable because they can be essentially produced in a short um, period of time. So that links into that second point there. And we're talking about months to years, not millions of years. We, to some degree, said that they are carbon neutral. Um, so they, in theory, result in no net release of CO2. They do have a comparable energy density to fossil fuels. But the downsides is that we have to utilise land to grow the crops needed for the biofuel production. And what that means is that we can't end up using those crops or that land for food production. So that's the whole food versus fuels debate, which we actually talked about last year. Um, it also lacks some infrastructure for their production, distribution and use. So it's still quite early days and the amount of infrastructure there is still quite limited. We know that the production and combustion still releases CO2 and these high temperature environments can still contribute to the formation of nitrogen oxides, which we know then can contribute to photochemical smog and acid rain. We also have to consider the renewable energy side. So specifically, SACE have specified that it's to do with wind and solar. So we're just going to summarize, I guess, how they, uh, how they may contribute to global warming and how that may differ compared to carbon-based fuels. So I've just grouped these together and in terms of their contribution, we can see that there essentially is no direct production of greenhouse gas emissions, given that they're using wind or uh, sunlight to generate electricity. So that's a form of energy production. But in order to produce, say, wind turbines or solar panels, again, this may, and it's likely it depends on the use of fossil fuels for their production, distribution and maintenance. So we have to factor that in and, and that is obviously going to contribute to global warming and the enhanced greenhouse effect.